Hey guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bassin. Today we are talking about where these bass go during the early fall transition. It's not fall yet, but it's not quite summer. Those cool nights are starting to happen. Things are changing at the lake. You're already starting to notice a shift in the bait fish and a shift in the bass. So today we're going to talk about where those fish are going and how to catch them. So what causes this change and why are we talking about it so early in the year? Well, it's simple. There are two factors that are going to get these bass to shift from true summer patterns and start heading towards the fall. Because again, it is a transition. It takes time. When you watch this video today, these things will just be beginning to work and they're going to get better and better and better. And then down the road, we'll talk to you about exactly what these fish are doing right in the heart of fall. So the two things that are going to impact these fish are nighttime temperatures and length of day. Once those two things start changing, when the days start getting shorter and you start getting those cooler nights, that begins the cycle. And you will see an immediate change. Maybe you're on a topwater bite and all of a sudden it's not as good as it was. Maybe you were dock fishing and all of a sudden you're catching less fish for no reason. Everything seems to be the same. Sure, the last few nights were a little cooler, but the day temps are the same. So what happened to your fish? The transition is what's happening. So these fish are going to shift from a true summer pattern. And we know already, because we've talked about it, that in the summer the bass split. You have those ultra shallow fish up in the grass, in the cover, in the docks, and then you've got the offshore or deeper fish, they're out there on the rock, they're on ledges, they're on humps, they're out there working current seams, those offshore outside fish. So both groups will remain separate groups going into the fall and they're going to move differently. Your shallow fish are going to begin holding to the solid cover. And we'll circle back, I'll tell you what I mean by that. Your offshore fish they're going to begin congregating. You're, you might have 20 spots in the summer that are really good. By the time these fish do the shift, you might have two or three or five spots. They're going to bunch up. Let's start shallow. And I am going to tell you all the baits and gear and everything that we recommend for this style of fishing. We'll get that at the end. But first, let's talk about where these fish are going. So your shallow fish, the first move that they will make is to pull up to harder structure. So you might have a giant grass flat today, three weeks from now or a month from now, depending on where you are in the country. If you're up north, this video might actually be a week or two late for you. Your transition started before we told you. If you're in the south, we're ahead of schedule because you're not getting those colder nights yet that will create the change. So it depends on where you are in the country with this shift, but just pay attention to your own outside conditions. It's not an actual temperature. I'm not going to tell you when your nights are 51 degrees that this happens because it's relative to the location. When your nights get colder than they had been and it's consistent, there's your change. Start looking. For some of you, it's already happened. So your shallow fish, the grass will begin to die back and it's not an overnight process, but the fish making the move, is an overnight process. The first moment that the grass starts to die, the fish are on the move. You almost can't even tell there was a change. It'll take you an extra four or five or six days to figure out that your grass is dying back. Your first sign will be that your fish are gone. But what those fish do is they abandon the dying grass and they head for the thickest pockets of grass, if you're on a grass lake, the thickest pockets of grass that are still alive because most of the grass will die but you'll have little patches that are holding on a lot longer than the rest and the fish will pile into those single spots if you've got a spot where you've got hard cover next to grass so say you've got grass on an edge but up inside you've got laid down trees the fish will abandon the grass go right into the hard cover they'll get on every laid down tree stump root ball dock piling all the hard structures they're going to suck right up against those 
Now, they're not up under that dock for shade like they were in the summer. They're up there to be against a hard structure. They're up there for comfort and to give them something to hunt against so they can hide behind it and ambush. They're not there for the shade like they were before. Your offshore fish, it's 100% bait driven. So the bait fish, what these fish are out there feeding on, the bait fish are going to begin moving towards fall. They're going to begin collecting and the bass are going to go with them. So you are looking for spots where they are gathering. They're going to gather in deeper holes. They're going to gather on really good transitions, the best transitions. So when you're looking at the map of your lake, you might have a steep wall and a point here and a steep wall and a point there, or a perfect bend and a ledge out here, but you have 50 of them. Look for the best. Look at the ones that when you, when you look at your lake map, and you're looking at all these similar spots. You got a good rock outcrop here, a good rock outcrop there, a ledge over here, a ledge over there. And you put your finger down and you go, that is the best one. The reason it's the best one is the same for you as it is for the fish. It's the largest, it's got the best transition. The bait fish know it and they will begin to gather there too. They gather on that best structure where they are the most protected, where they have the best access to deep water and the bass will just pile in. So all the spots around your best spots will begin failing as all the fish pile into the single locations. And you should be able to find a few of them. For us, we're looking for that deep rock near the biggest holes because those deeper holes, they're going to be more stable as you get into the true cold months. And they've got that quick access that's a primo spot. So on our lake, we have so many offshore spots. Come dead of winter, there's two, three, four, five spots. But the fish are already gathering around them at the beginning of the fall transition. Does that make sense? Now, as far as how to catch these fish, like I said, everything is going to be bait fish driven, except there are also fish eating crawfish in both locations, shallow and deep, but more so deep. Those rock fish, the crawfish really become a factor. So let's start shallow. Up shallow, these fish were in the grass. You know that we like throwing the whopper plopper and a buzz bait and a frog and flipping and all those things. Some of that is going to stick. There will still be a topwater bite. There will still be a flip bite right up to the end. And then after that, we're talking all reaction. So let's run through the baits. First and foremost, while you still have grass, we're flipping. Ounce and a half weight. If you can get away with less, get away with less. But ounce, ounce and a half. I really do prefer a wide gap hook over a straight shank hook. It's personal preference, but I love a wide gap. I've always used that Gamakatsu Superline. This is that owner up, watch me draw a blank. I always draw a blank with this one hook, uh, but I'll link it for you down in the video description. It really doesn't matter. I think it's the jungle hook though, but that guy in a five aught is phenomenal. It is strong. And in the Gamakatsu EWG Superline, I use a four aught. But that's set up with either a Rage Craw or a Jackal Archelon. Those are my two that I've got the most confidence in right now. Let me open this one up. I'll show you this one while I'm talking. These baits are what you're going to continue to flip around the grass. Because like I said, most of the grass will die, but not all. The fish will pile into the remaining grass. That is prime time for flipping. Your top water bite will be fading away. It's getting harder to catch a frogfish, harder to catch a plopper or a buzz bait or any other fish. But the flip bite will just get better and better and better and better until that grass finally kicks off and dies. So this guy, you Texas rig it, right? Pop out the side. But instead of punching all the way through, this bait is hollow. I just punch halfway through and leave the hook inside the bait. The hook point's just inside there sitting in a cavity. You wanna talk about weedless, it is weedless. 
but my hookup ratio is amazing. The bait is so soft that when they eat it, they get that hook point. But I love that setup right there this time of year. They eat it so good. So that's one. Number two is the jig. If I could only have one jig, it would be a half ounce pitching jig. Arky style head. It will go through anything. It's got a stout enough hook. The head will go through anything. I'm fishing a half ounce, so I can fish around almost any dying grass. I can fish around wood. I can fish around rock. Everything. It's just that one do-all jig. You want a natural color like a go-to or a super matte brown, green pumpkin craw, one of those really natural ones. And then I pair it up with just a regular beaver. Minimal action, really good profile. Green pumpkin is my go-to color for that. Just pairs up really well with all those natural colored jigs. As far as how I'm fishing that, I'm taking that punch rig and I'm throwing it into the thickest of the remaining grass. I'm taking the jig and fishing the hard structures. So if your grass is dying back and the fish are shifting up into the rock and the lay downs or stumps on a field or up on the dock pilings, the pitching jig will do all of it. And if in a half ounce, I can do it effectively. So I eliminate all those other things I need to be throwing and I can just work with that. Now on the reaction side, that's the fun side. Reaction side, I actually keep it really, really simple. Tim and I have essentially two baits that we throw. The main one is a square bill. I like the biggie because I get that knock. Tim really likes the lucky craft because it's silent. Two different approaches. So when we're fishing together, one guy throws one, one guy throws the other, and we find out which one they're eating on that day. But both are phenomenal baits. You wanna go shad colors, either true shad, like a ghost minnow type color, or something with a bunch of flash, like an American shad, or it's reflective. And then how you fish these is critical during this transition period. We are fishing them hard and fast and aggressive, just as fast as you can burn that handle and then pause. Crank, 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 pause. Crank, crank, pause. Crank, 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 all the way back to the boat. You want these fish hard charging. The water is still relatively warm all the way through the transition. It's not until you get well into fall that that water is cooling off significantly. So they will still run a bait down. And like I said, everything is bait fish driven. So as this transition happens right now, we're focusing on the fact that grass is dying. A few weeks from now, you need to be focusing on where the bait fish are gathering. That's where that becomes a huge factor. The thing about the square bill, especially in dying grass, is you can rip it through it. You can clean that bait really easy. So burn, 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 it catches in the grass, rip. Dying grass is really weak. It'll just split and blow out of your way. You can run right through it. It's not like that fresh, lively springtime grass that you'll just get hung up in. It'll stay on your hooks. This isn't the same thing. You just get snot on your hooks and the fish will still eat it. So fish aggressively, and again, you're looking for where the bait fish are starting to gather. Where is that going to happen? Depends on the style of lake. If you have a large round bowl lake like what we have right here, where it's fairly featureless, it's actually really simple. Take a look at your map, and what you are looking for is points where the bait fish can be compressed, can be gathered. So if you have an overall bare shoreline where there's almost nothing happening, but you find a single seawall that sticks out 10 or 15 or 30 or 50 feet and it creates a pocket, you better believe the bass will run bait down that shoreline and then lock them into that pocket and seal it off and ambush on them until there is no bait left. Now, bigger scale, if you have a bare shoreline and you have a single point that comes out, they'll be using both sides of that point to collect the bait. If they don't have bait collected, they're going to sit off the end of it. Because if they sit off the end, when the bait comes from either way, they'll see them. But as the transition continues, they'll actually get it bunched up and collected and it'll be permanent. And they will eat that bait for a long time until it runs out. So all you're looking for in a featureless lake 
is the places where they can gather that bait and pack it into a spot. Same thing, bare shoreline, if it's got a little pocket in it, just a little cut, not even a big cove. We're not talking a deep arm, just a little bump where they can corral the bait and then seal off that opening. Same thing, that's all you're after. Depth doesn't matter. They'll corral bait in 10 feet of water. They will corral bait in a foot of water in the fall. These fish are not afraid. They are there to eat. They are not concerned with depth. Now, in a lake that actually has features, so a lake that's got a bunch of big fingers and arms that run off, well then what's going to happen is the bass are going to begin pushing the bait out of the open water, off of the outside structures, off of the humps, they'll start gathering the bait, especially in a lake that has spotted bass, it will happen even faster because the spotted bass love to get offshore and just run that bait in the open. Large mouth that takes a little bit longer for them to gather the bait, but they still do it. What they're going to do is you're looking for those long fingers that run back. You want the deepest cuts. So if you have a cut that's coming in and it's gonna run, I mean, I'm just making this up as I go, but let's say it's a thousand yards deep, but halfway back, it's already 20 feet deep. And then it just slow tapers from there. Oh, you better believe they'll use it. But if you have the exact same thing and halfway back, it's a hundred feet deep, you'll have way more fish using it. Because the ones that have deep water all the way to the back, they can run that bait up in there, they can pin it, but then as the weather begins to fluctuate, as the cold really does come in in the fall and headed into winter, the fish can just adjust their depth much more easily, but they can still hold that bait as long as possible. If it's shallower, eventually they're going to have to back out, and then they can't corral the bait if the bait has a huge distance to work in. Does that make sense? So it's really, it's the same thing. You're looking for the best of the best spots. Those fish are going to be gathering that bait down in the holes, up against those hard walls, and then they're going to be pushing them way up the back of pockets. In a lake where it's big and open and shallow, they're going to be pushing that bait up and corralling it against any little edge that they've got. If there are no edges, you'll find it on a micro scale. You'll find a little log that sticks out in the water and you'll have three or four bass that use that one edge, shoreline, log. They'll use that one edge to trap enough food to eat. And then you'll see it on a grand scale where you'll find a pocket, but that pocket's 75 yards wide and 30 yards deep and you'll find a hundred bass with a bait ball stuffed in there and they'll eat those things for a month. It works. Now for the fish that are out there deeper, that are gathering on that deeper structure, the jig, still a major factor. Oh, I almost forgot top water. That's the other player up shallow. We'll circle back to deep water. The other player up shallow is top water. The frog, the buzz bait, those are all great options, but as that grass dies back and you start getting that open water again, you don't have grass all over the place, you can go back to the topwater baits that those fish haven't heard since springtime. My favorite is the Rover. This is the Sooner color, or at least it was before I beat all the paint off of it. But there's two or three colors that I have a ton of confidence in. Specifically the Rover, because the Rover has a really unique sound. It's halfway in between some of my other favorite baits. So I have three or four topwaters that we really like in that walking bait category. This one is that middle sound that works the most often. So it's always the one I start with in the fall. That's the Rover, I think it's the 128. But again, we'll link everything in the video description. But you walk that bait in and around that bait, especially early and late in the day when the fish are really actively blowing up on the bait. See, as the day wears on, early and late, you'll see them just grenading, pushing that bait up on the shoreline, thrashing it up shallow. Middle of the day, that will die back a lot of the time, but the fish haven't gone anywhere because they still have to keep the bait there. They're just not actively blowing up. That's when your other baits work so well. But early and late, that rover bite can be mind blowing. All right, let's head back out deep now. So the jig on that rock, huge factor. That same rock 
has got a lot of crawdads in it. You can do a lot of damage there on a jig when those fish aren't active. But the way I prefer to catch them, and it will get better and better and better as that transition goes on, is the deep crank. Keep it simple. Uh, if I could only pick a couple, it'd be a 6XD and a 10XD. Now there are a lot of other great deep cranks. We've talked about a lot of other great deep cranks. And farther into this fall, we'll do another deep crank video and talk about a lot of different options so you can really fine tune what you're doing. But if you're just gonna have a couple of baits and have some confidence in them, 6XD and a 10XD. As far as colors go, you want a shad profile, a bolder shad profile. The farther into fall you get, you wanna get away from the bold and go natural. But starting out, you stay bold. That's Chartreuse Sexy Shed 6XD. We do upgrade all our hardware. Those are Gamakatsu EWG size two trebles. Makes a huge difference in actually getting those fish in the boat. But a bold shad type profile and then a craw color. Craw color is a major deal. In the West, it's huge. In the rest of the country, it works and a lot of people don't do it in a deep diver. One, two punch, and it's amazing. And then same thing with the 10XD. I mean, I think this box right here is very telling. Shad, craw. I mean, it's that simple. You really want to simplify your gear in the fall. We're talking about where these fish are gathering, so you already know they're there. When you get on those right structures, you, you have the confidence, you're on the fish, especially if you see them blowing up on bait. But out there on the deep stuff, you can see it on your electronics. You'll see the bait balls, you'll see fish underneath them, or you'll stop and you'll start catching fish. So you know you're around the fish. And the nice thing in the fall, now the transition, they're on the move. But if you find them gathering on a spot, they're not going to continue moving. You've got the spot. It's going to get better and better and better as the weeks and months go. So you have the confidence, which is something people don't have throughout the year. Right now you do. If you've got fish coming to you, you know they're there. So simplify, you've got confidence baits, and you just fish. If they're not cooperating, you know it's not you. It's not your baits. They're just not cooperating at that time. Try something a little different or back off and come back. Back off, come back. And when you get there, when they're firing, it is unbelievable. Now, as we truly get into fall, the baits are going to shift again. There are a lot more options. We do a lot of different things. That video is coming, but that would be way ahead of schedule right now. It is still right at the end of summer. I mean, summer itself is going to last, but the fishing, the summer fishing, we're right at the tail end. Southern guys, you'll hang on to a little longer. Northern guys, you're a little ahead of schedule. Start making your transition, you'll find your fish again. Those fish that you were on that have vanished, you will locate them again and it will get good and it will stay good. I hope this video helps you guys. Following these fish throughout the seasons is difficult. The transitions are the most difficult. It's even harder for me to explain it to you because it is a more difficult time. Once we get settled into fall, it'll be really easy. You're going to have a blast. But even in this transition, you can smash on these fish. You can have a blast out on the lake. Don't be afraid to get out there. Guys, if you enjoyed the video, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications. YouTube has changed the way that they notify people of new videos. If you haven't physically gone in lately and turned on notifications, you will not know when new videos are coming out. Thanks again, we appreciate you. We'll talk to you soon.